Well, hi, and thank you so much for join, coming and joining me here in my shop for another step uh, along the way to getting this radio to work really well. So I've replaced all the capacitors in it. It seemed to me as I progressively replaced the capacitors, the radio's operation went lower and lower till finally, once they were all changed, I don't think I received a thing out of this radio. <laughs> Which seems kind of backwards to what you would think would happen. Uh, all those capacitors, here they all are right here, all tested kind of on the edge. Um, you know, it depends upon where their position is in the radio. For instance, any one of these, so, and some of these were doing this, I'm sure, blocking high voltage from grids. Uh, these aren't good enough to do the job. So those are all changed out. What to do next? So uh, I think the next couple of things to do, uh, one is test all the tubes. Maybe that's why this radio is weak. It may have a weak tube in it. Uh, number two is uh, go over the schematic and get ready to do the alignment. So before doing an alignment, I like to look over the schematic very carefully and get familiar with the uh, design of the radio as much as I can anyway before I start twiddling a whole bunch of controls and the like. So um, what I'm thinking here is, uh, I don't think I'll do it. <laughs> I'll stop thinking that right now. Why don't we go over the schematic and I'll see if I can test these tubes at the same time I'm doing that. That, that, sounds, that sounds complicated. Good. Okay, well I actually found the Municadio manual for this radio and its sister radio, the U version, Run 2. Run 2. There he is. Description. Bands. 48 to 54 megacycles. That's pretty pretty strange that that little band is on there. Back. Speaker headphone switch. Terminal strip. Yeah, they're showing how to hook up the antenna so you see you uh, maintain the link if you're using a wire antenna. And open the link if you're using a balanced antenna like a dipole or what I use are folded dipoles, so it looks like this, except there's another wire. It goes from this end right down to the other end, kind of shorting out the antenna in a way, but not really. Uh, so that's why you see me uh, hook up my antenna, even though it's from a uh, cable, like a, a coax cable. I'm still connecting it to these two pins and leaving the link open. The uh, An interesting thing is this, this ground is pretty, if you use a single wire, this ground is very important. information here we won't go through service instructions tube replacement uh, 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 nothing special here oh good stringing diagrams I'm gonna have to make use of one of these band spread this one has to be replaced I think alignment procedure very good I'll go to layout Just shows the tubes and the dials. Why didn't they bother numbering all these at this point? It had this nice diagram right on this page. Phooey. Oh, here they are. <laughs> here they are, all numbered. Oh, good. There's a nice diagram here. There's one underneath. Yeah, great. Of course, I've replaced all these capacitors. Uh, okay. That's great. Parts list. Uh, oh, look at this sheet. Check this out. Socket views are bottom views. So uh, these are socket uh, voltage tests that can be taken. Well, this is worth doing. After we test the tubes, it could, we, could, we could do this. You can find bad resistors that way fairly easily. Great. Tube socket voltage chart. Wow, this is quite a thorough manual. I mean, this is a let's call it a, a junior communications receiver so the people engineering this would have uh, maybe uh, had, had a little bit of a different idea in their head about what to do so here's half the schematic here's the other half unfortunately it's on two pages this is what I want to run through now let's start with the power supply so first thing to note is this capacitor off of one side 
and this is an unparalyzed, unparalyzed, <laughs> unpolarized plug. So you can flip this in either way. So this could be, you know, 120 volts above ground, or it could be the ground. This capacitor is leaky, if it was, and it was a little bit leaky. It would leak uh, onto the chassis uh, and then give you a chance for some uh, chassis problems. Now, like talking about the chassis, I see this connection. So clearly, the, in this radio, they're using the chassis as part of the supply circuit for the tube heaters. So probably at each tube socket, you'd find a wire coming to one tube terminal and the other one just going to ground, going to the chassis, rather. So it's, it's, it's worthwhile seeing how they've done these kinds of things. Now, what else is on the chassis? So the chassis is thoroughly involved in this radio. It's everywhere. In some radios, rather than utilize the chassis, they'll run a special black wire, that'll, or a wire that'll run through the radio, picking up all these points you see that are tied to the chassis. Then they make one connection to the chassis through a capacitor. Probably, maybe here, I, I guess here is where it's done. Usually a resistor in parallel with it. But this one, they're using the chassis as part of the circuit. Okay, back to the power supply, back to the, the side. So we have a little bit of a safety issue with this capacitor, but I've replaced it already. And there's no other connection into the radio. So beyond the power supply, everything here is isolated away from the world of uh, the hydro system. But in my case, this is plugged into another transformer that isolates it away even further. I feel like, can you, can you be further? Better read these notes now. Resistor values in ohms. Let's make this a little bigger. Capacitor values are in uh, microfarads. The chassis connection. On off switch is part of volume control. Phono switch is part of sensitivity control. I guess the idea is when you click on the phonograph input, you at the same time turn down the sensitivity of the radio. But isn't there a switch somewhere? A switch from... Uh, does not seem to be a switch. What? Well, yeah, what am I talking about? I just, I just talked about the switch. The switch is on the... Uh, where is that? Here. Tone switch. Well, it's not supposed to be hooked up. Where, where's, where's the phono input? We will get to it. There it is. Phono input. No, that's, a, that's headphone output. Phono input should be near the anyway, okay, somewhere here. <laughs> Not to worry about. It. We'll we'll find it as we keep going. Okay, now we're on the other side of the power supply transformer. So the receive standby switch is opening the high voltage circuit, killing the high voltage to all the tubes. It leaves the heaters running full. Just cuts off the current flow through the tube, so your tubes aren't wearing out maintains full heater voltage. Okay. Now we come through the rectifier here, 5Y3 rectifier. We get into this fairly heavy duty filter here with three capacitors, 501010. I've done nothing about this. I can't hear any hum in the radio at this point. And uh, it's using resistors here as part of the Pi filter. Two water, a one water. The most filtered power is taken here to the early stages of the radio. A less filtered version is sent to the output tube. How does it get onto the plate? Oh, even less, even less filter. The reason for this is, uh, you know, at this point, you're not really amplifying the hum much. But way back here, early stages, a little bit of hum gets amplified and comes out the speaker, screaming out of the speaker. So you really need a highly filtered DC for the front end of the radio where the sensitivity is. Not, not so much filtered for the back end. So I, I think it's safe to say all these radios hum. Many of them hum so low you could never hear it. I think that's really the safe statement. What's going on here? Okay stay on this. So now, so we finish with the power supply. Notice this resistor here on V4. What's going on with V4? 
that it needs a resistor. V4, what is V4? They didn't write it there, but I've got it here, right beside me. Uh, well, you know what they did? They, they've labeled the tube type, so it's, you know, it's punched right on the chassis here, 6H6 and stuff like that, but they didn't label the tube number. Okay, we won't worry about that. Let's move on. Moving on. So, from here we'll go to the front end of the radio. Here we are. Okay, it's a bit of a rough ride getting here, but here we are. So, what do we see? We see... We see a mixer tube. Where's the front end? Oh, oh, the oscillator tube. First I have, second I have. Is there not an RF amplifier in here? There may not be. So here's where the signal's coming from. Where's it coming from? It's coming from way over here. Okay, I've got to flip to this one. Oh. Audio amplifier, oscillator. No, there's no front end RF2. So, you know, this radio gets knocked down a big notch right away. Uh, without the front end tube, RF amplifier tube, and the tuned circuits that come with it, um, things like image rejection is going to be poor in this radio. So we, we have these tu this tuned operation here coming, I guess, right off the antenna. This must be for the oscillator. Sets of coils. This is the oscillator here. So this must be antenna. Doesn't really say, does it? T1, T2, T3, T4. It's not as simple as it looks at first. So, so, so this is producing the local oscillator. Uh, frequency 455, is that correct? 455 kilohertz away. It is recommended that the value of any replacement correspond to the nominal value of the part being replaced. Well, well yeah. Isn't that kind of common sense? Hmm. Okay. So after the antenna signal, Here's the antenna terminals. I finally found them. After the antenna signal goes through these tuned circuits, look, they have they have to be uh, aligned here. So there's a bit of tuning. It comes into the mixer tube. On in this case, in this case, it's coming in on grid one, I think. Grid one. Yeah, is the antenna signal. So sometimes in these tubes, they'll use grid one. Oh, wait a minute. 6BA6 mixer tube. Okay, this is a little different. Um, classically, you're using a tube with another grid in here. Uh, so, you, so you basically have two control grids and you end up with two screen grids. But not in this case. In this case, they're just using a 6BA6 amplifier tube as the mixer and they're bringing in the two signals one on the grid and the other on the screen. So is, is the screen... Oh, wait a minute, there's a capacitor here. Is it, is, is, are they mixing them right on the grid together? Oops, oh, oh, look, look, what's this? What's this doing here? So what they're doing in this radio is they're supplying both signals onto the signal grid. And uh, I, I, they get mixed in this tube. It's just a little unusual. Um, not saying there's anything wrong, good or bad about it. It's just not how most radios are built. Or am I misunderstanding this now? So, so the output from here it's, it's it's going to where can it go it, well that's the uh, that's the tuning capacitor that's the other tuning capacitor there doesn't go anywhere can't go anywhere 
no wires leaving. This one must be bringing the P plus in. That's so this is also P plus. Somebody at my door. Wait a minute, I can't. Ooh, did I jump wires? I think I did. Screen. Oh, look who's here. Oh my gosh. You know, Peanut, I'm right in the middle of doing this schematic thing. Have you got any tolerance for that? Peanut. Oh, he, he thinks he sees some food on the floor, so he's investigating. There's no food on the floor. Well, okay, so at this point, the two signals are coming in on the grid. They're getting mixed up in here. Out of this tube is coming a lo yeah, the local oscillator signal, the original antenna signal, and the plus and minuses of those two signals. The minus, if everything's arranged right, should end up with a 455 difference frequency. Or let's put it this way. If there is such a frequency, 455 kilohertz, getting mixed out of here, it's going to find its way through this transformer. Everything else, because the transformer is tuned, everything else looks at this circuit like it's a low impedance circuit. So all frequencies off of 455, farther off more so, they just can't find their way through here. There's no way. Okay, Peanut, I can hear it in your voice. I gotta stop for a minute and keep my cat happy. You know, as you, if you watch my videos, you know almost every morning my cat, uh, Peanut, comes in and demands to spend some time with me. And I disappear from the shop for about 10 minutes. He sits on my lap, I watch a little TV, and after 10 minutes he just gets up and leaves. <laughs> it's just, I guess he just needs his lap time every day. Now let's get back to that uh, schematic here. Okay, so I was just realizing that there isn't a typical mixer uh, arrangement in this radio, or at least the way they're operating this, this tube. That's fine. Um, so after this, after here, all you've got is 455 kilohertz continuing through the radio. Everything else has been rejected or suppressed, and that, that suppression continues on as you go through each of these tune stages. Everything that's not 455 gets more and more suppressed. So, uh, so these, you know, I replaced this capacitor. Um, what's it doing? It's providing a ground at the bottom of this coil from an AC point of view or a signal point of view. So the signal sees the resistor and the coil, and actually when this is resonant, it doesn't really... Yeah, I don't know what to say about that exactly, but uh, uh, in any case, if, you, if this is weakened, this coil will operate weaker. Probably, probably be off frequency a little bit too, maybe. Moving on here. So here we have 455 on the grid here, amplified and sent through this transformer. Now, this is where the sensitivity control is operating. What are they doing here? What are they doing here? So it's on the cathode circuit. like it's affecting the cathode bias on these two tubes. That's what it looks like. Uh, if you bias the cathode more positive, that's what this resistor would do. It's the same as making the uh, uh, grid go negative relative to the cathode. So it's a very common way of uh, biasing tubes. In fact, as we look here, they're all done this way. There's a cathode resistor and a bypass. Cathode resistor bypass, cathode resistor, 100, see they're small resistors, 100 ohms, bypass right there. Now how does this actually work? Um, so you have, if we, if we just ignore this right now, just ignore the variable part. So we'd have, what do we have on here? We have, so we have a ground connection through a large resistor through a small resistor to the cathode. Now that's pretty large compared to these. Is there a little piece of wire I missed here in this deal before I... Ye uh, not, oh, this is kind of weird. What's this? Um, I, I'm not, not 
not sure why this capacitor is here. Maybe for neutralizing os uh, spurious oscillations in the tube, perhaps. Okay, so out here comes 455, a little bit stronger now, into this tuned circuit, and then out onto the grid of this guy. Second IF gets amplified, looks pretty identical to that one. Now we got to switch down to the other schematic, unfortunately. Plate screen grid. Maybe it shows up down here, too. Yeah, well, no. That's V3. This is V2. Oh, no, it's V3. V3, okay, so they've repeated V3 here. So now it's coming out, it's going through another transformer, T12. The, uh, this is all just pretty typical stuff for operating the tube, I think. But come out of here, they've shielded this wire. It's coming into this diode. So here is where uh, they're going to throw away half of the RF signal, leaving the other half of the RF signal. That's the first stage in recovering the audio from it. The next stage is to use a capacitor-resistor combination. Maybe it's this one. Maybe it's down in here somewhere. That essentially removes the RF and leaves you with the variations in the RF strength which equals the audio signal. And those variations then are usually sent through a volume control pretty quick from here. But there's a lot more going on here. Let's just stop at this point. Just, we'll just say that coming out of here somewhere is the audio. We'll figure it out in a minute. But what's going on over here? We have another diode noise limiter switch. So typically, noise limiters in these radios really amounts to a diode. Here's the diode. And if the noise signal is high enough, it will leak through the diode, essentially be shorted away in the diode. And if the signal is low enough, this diode won't do anything. It's somehow it's blocked by maybe all these resistors here somehow. Some way, some kind of DC voltage on it, something going on here. Nothing to do with the regular operation of the radio, though. It just has to do with this noise limiter technique. So, in the early days, uh, noise amounted to uh, ignition noise from automobiles, but I'm pretty sure we don't get that anymore. So now, if we, if we follow the audio, I believe they're putting a shield on this wire because already the audio is flowing in here, so to speak. Kind of like that. You can kind of say that. Or, let's put it this way, any influences uh, at an audio level, audio frequency, any audio type stuff that might affect this wire is going to come out the speaker. So they've shielded and there's probably another shielded wire in here. Where's the volume control? Audio amp BFO. Well, I would guess we're going to get from here to here now. Let's follow the grid. Uh, we'll assume... Um, what are they saying here? Is, what is it? 6 SC7. They don't see this tube too often. I'm going to assume these are two separate grids. They're showing almost connected here. I'm going to assume they're two separate grids. But one common cathode. Okay, uh, so we're assuming the signal's on here. How would it get there? We get there on this wire. We get this wire. We'll come. Hey, look, volume control. I knew I'd find it sooner or later. What's this switch? Switch to phono. Oh, there's the phono input. Okay, I knew it would all show up. Shielded wire on the phono input. Okay. Uh, capacitor would change this. So we have the audio coming out, being monkeyed around with in here. Coming along here. So actually, you can kind of, kind of, so oh, there's a ground right there. So it's got to be coming in, got to be coming along. Must, must, must be coming along through here. Now I'm going to guess a lot of this arrangement in here is to uh, control the uh, tone quality of the audio. The 
engineers come up with this arrangement to do the, do the trick. I think that's the way to look at this stuff. And this is this, what is this? So this is probably the ADC line, judging by the size of this resistor. Because once you get onto the uh, sort of the earlier part of the ABC line, this, which is interesting, uh, it's all high impedance because it's just going to grids. So you can't have a high impedance grid hooked up to a low impedance plate circuit. That can't happen. So you need this resistor in between to uh, avoid that. To, to maintain the high impedance at this side. There's no current flow in this circuit, shouldn't be. Uh, uh, so there's no voltage drop on this big resistor. That, that's that's kind of half true. That's more than half true. But what's going on here now? Uh, BFO, so a BFO is a specialty item in a radio like this. It's another oscillator oscillating in the audio well, not necessarily in the audio range. Could be in the audio range. Could also be oscillating in the IF frequency range. Um, so, so, so here, let's just go. On, let's start from here, from the speaker, work our way back into it. So, speaker. Uh, something worth noting is there a ground in there? Look at that. There is. So, on this side of the transformer, there is a connection to the chassis. Have to pay attention to that. I hook up my equipment here to monitor the uh, speaker, the output here. I gotta make sure I put a ground on this side. So I'll put a ground on here. I'm not gonna hear much. So on the other side of the output transformer, you know, I'm gonna comment on this. Uh, you know, virtually every radio we listen to, uh, our amplifier has an output transformer. Twice I've had the opportunity to hear radios designed without an output transformer. They're commonly called OTL amplifiers, output transformerless. That's actually the term that's used. One of them was a European radio I just worked on here a month and a half ago, and when I played it, it immediately reminded me of another transformerless amplifier I did very early on. In fact, it's among the very first videos I ever put on YouTube. This huge five or ten thousand dollar output transformerless prototype mono amps, two of them. I got them all done, hooked them up to my speakers. Again, it just had this sound quality that just stood out, just like that radio. So I think if you do enough reading, you'll find out that there's a lot of degradation in the sound quality that occurs in these transformers. And having the heavy impedances here and all that, these things affect the sound we hear, but we're so used to hearing it this way that we don't really recognize until you hear a transformerless amplifier. So that's a long speech there. I'm uh, just confirming my own what, what I've heard with my own ears. But there's a tremendous difference. It, you know what I would describe it as? The sound is present. It sounds like it's present in the room with you on these uh, output transformerless amplifiers. It's quite distinct. Oh well, okay, enough of that. So this one obviously has an output transformer. What do we got going here? Tone switch. So it's kind of obvious what that's doing. Capacitor here, resistor. Uh, it's just melting off some of the highs. We're by bypassing, some of the high frequency bypasses this, this uh, transformer. Yeah, that's a fairly large capacitor here. It's probably to kill any RF that might still be floating around after making it through everything. Uh, I'll put, this is a typical arrangement. Now, is there any feedback? Feedback can be taken out of here. Can be taken out of here. I'm looking for a wire that's coming from this part of the radio and just for some unknown reason heading way back to the front again. I don't see any such wire. This is just a this is just a screen power supplied wire. This would be the suspicious one. It doesn't go anywhere. It just goes here. And there's nothing coming from here. So there's no feedback. Uh, feedback is a technique used to greatly reduce uh, harmonic distortion uh, in 
the output of a simple amplifier like this is very, very commonly used. The price you pay is it reduces the output a little bit, so uh, you're, you're, you would have to turn the volume up or uh, heavy up your amplifier to get the power you need if you're going to use feedback, but the benefit is very, very high, like it's really good at reducing uh, distortion. Not in this radio. Uh, so here, so so we worked our way back to here. So this is the signal coming in. I'll replace this guy. This is the this is one of the capacitors that this is a little bit leaky. The pressure, well, there's not much pressure over here. Uh, not much pressure. And in, in, in more typical uh, radio, uh, this has B plus on it. And you don't want any of that getting on this grid. So you need a really good capacitor here. They've all been changed. Now, so so we so we have the signal here coming out of here, and so this is just a triode boosting it. What's going on over here? BFO. So it's got to be an oscillator. So here's a here's a coil capacitor. Now in this radio, it looks like this is fixed. Is that little arrows there? It must be tunable. You probably adjust T13 to control the pitch of the oscillator, but there's no front panel adjustment for BFO pitch. So this is a fixed pitch. Uh, that's a little bit tricky. Uh, depends what you're trying to do with the BFO. You just put a tone into Morse code. It's not so critical. I'm trying to clarify people's voices. The pitch setting on this would be quite important. Be interesting to see how they recommend this is adjusted. Okay, just happen to be sharing a tube. It's a coincidental thing. I don't... Well... No. See, the cathode goes straight to the ground. So, because of that, either side can't hear the other. I think that's the way I would put it. So, you know, it looks like one shared cathode. It's... You can think of it this way. The chassis is shared everywhere. This cathode shared just here. I mean, the, the sharing thing. Am I making any sense? I may not be. But well, that's okay. <laughs> Can't make sense all the time. AM, no, CW, so so closing the switch turns on this oscillator by applying plate voltage to it. And uh, it also clicks in this resistor. 120 ohm. Oh. It's on the far side of when I just finished explaining how this is very high impedance. But not when you close the switch. It's 120 ohms to current on. Okay, don't don't quite get why why this would be an advantage. Wouldn't it just kind of? Well, it would stop the AVC action, I, or or or, or minimize. I don't know. I don't know what that does. So I don't know. That's interesting. But this side is just switching on the oscillator. On where have we gotten to? So here, here's the oscillator. Did we look at that? Look at it on the other page here. 6C4 oscillator. Uh, the oscillating speed is set by these these combined coils and capacitors. All of them are lots of adjustments through here. One there. A series one there. Well, I don't think there's too much more to to, uh, to poke around. So just to make it really simple, antenna comes in here, goes through these coils, tickles this grid, along with the local oscillator tickling it too. This tube must be operated in some non-linear fashion in order to generate the harmonics and the mixing. The mixing is what I want to say. So interesting how this tube's being operated, what kind of plate voltage it has on it, and stuff like that. We can actually take a look at that in a sec. So anyway, through here, through the IF, out of the IF, through this final um, transformer into the detector diode, throwing away the RF, recovering the audio, amplifying the audio here, shooting it into this tube and out the speaker. Meanwhile, I got a BFO. 
the output of the BFO, if it's turned on, is fed into the screen. It looks like, it looks like it's jammed into the screens, but I'm not going to study it any further than that. Very good. Well, that's good. Now, we should spend a moment looking at the uh, uh, instructions for aligning the radio, just so we have, in case there's something tricky in here. Remove the chassis from the cabinet. I did that. Signal generator modulated output. Covering all that. Got one. Use non-metallic alignment tool. Well, we'll see about that. Connect output meter across speaker voice coil. Control settings, there they are. See figure nine for location of alignment adjustments, great. Signal generator connections, signal generator frequencies. Bands, selection setting. You do the A, B, C, D, right in order. Receiver dial setting, fully open, fully open, here, there, here, there, everywhere. Adjust these guys probably in this order, just like that. Adjust for maximum audio output, voice call, use just enough signal generator output, 50 milliwatt reading on the output meter. Do one more. S9, just one thing. Set the AM switch at CW. Oh, so, so, so this is the setting of the, uh, of the uh, BFO, I believe. Actually, say what it is, does it? Just says S9. Adjust S9 for zero B. Okay, that's a hint. That's definitely a BFO. High side A1 on antenna terminal strip through antenna terminal strip through a 330 ohm resistor. So you're trying to imitate. Like what the worry here is, the equipment you're using has a very low impedance. My signal generator is 50 ohms. 50 ohms onto the antenna is going to disturb the radio somehow. So you want to make the radio think it's hooked up to a regular antenna. So you stick this resistor in here. This is a very simple way of doing it. There are more complicated ways of imitating, of making your uh, equipment appear like a regular antenna. So you're tuning the radio through a range of frequencies. So, I mean, there's nothing happening with this resistor through a range of frequencies, but antennas vary as you go up and down in frequency. So if you want to mimic one, you need something that will also go up and down impedance-wise as the frequency goes up and down as you're working on the radio. There is a standard, there is a standard for this. I have built the standard circuit and I also have the standard in a professionally made little box that I use almost all the time called an antenna simulator. So, uh, you know, if you don't have this stuff, uh, you know, you can always hook up and disconnect, hook up, try different resistors, see what it does to the radio. Find out for yourself how sensitive these things really are. You know, it could be that this is the best thing you can do. 330 but if you used 100 ohm it's hardly any worse or if you didn't do anything it's hardly any worse it's just this is the best they're not telling you how critical this is now maybe on the other hand he said 30 he didn't say 300 he said 330 you know maybe it's really critical experimenting can find that kind of stuff out Oop. I assume it's a he maybe it was a she and then we do maximum output, maximum, 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 maximum. Okay, so it's quite straightforward on the alignment side. I'll just take a quick look at where the controls are in case there's something funny. Top and bottom. So we have to get at the bottom of the radio to do this. It's giving you the numbers top and bottom. Actually, you don't have to actually get under the radio. I think these are hollow hollow uh, slugs. I have a tool you push right through it from the top down into the bottom slug. The problem with that is the tool is weak, and if the slug is sticky, you're going to have trouble. There's all these guys, and all these guys. A, B, C, D, E, F. There's no pattern here. G, H, I, J. No real pattern to it. Anything hidden? Hidden. Just going to say, what's that? So that's a hole. That's just a hole in the chassis. And what's this? This is a hole with some wires going through it in the chassis and it has a protector on it. I guess that's what that ring represents. The same thing up here, probably. Yeah, a hole with a brass protector and wires going through it. Oh, here's one right here, S9. 
There it is. BFO adjustment. I see it. Great. We're ready to go. Time to uh, time to test these tubes here. Okay. So the first tube is a rectifier tube. Five Y three. Let's just double check here. O seven O three zero zero seven zero three zero P zero six zero P zero six zero. 25 E. We're ready. So it has a, a uh, warning here that there should be a short on, I think, pin in one, I think. Let's watch and see what happens here. There it is. That's normal on this tube. We're in the test position now. Ready to run the test. Rectifiers and diodes. The rectifier should get up beyond my finger here. Single test, two passes. Okay. Okay, we're set up to do a 6K6, but look, someone wrote new February 68. <laughs> uh, uh, I don't know, is that still new? We're all set here, but let's just double check, just to be sure. 6.3 volts, because it was at five for the last two. Two on the signal level. 46 with an H, 07345, 07345, 0610, 0610. She's golden. So the rectifier tube and the output tube in a radio work generally work harder than the other tubes. In particular, the output tube is kind of intended to be the workhorse in the radio and uh, it gets worked and they wear out so if any tubes are to be worn out just through natural use you suspect the output tube or maybe the rectifier tube and a worn out rectifier tube i think your radio might hum a bit uh, i'm not sure about that okay this will be warmed up now here we go couldn't be any shorts anywhere there are none so this tube 6k6 the reject point is 1360. 1360 is uh, you know, up around here. Da, da, da. Wow, okay, so that's a really good shape. It's still like new from 1968. I wonder if I should correct that now, cross that out and put 2020, 30 years from now. Somebody else will find it. Okay, that's, that's two tubes, tested good. Okay, so the next tube is going to be V1. This is the 1978. This is the, uh, well, that, I think that means 1978, but it could also mean 78% done in a uh, emissions tester. We don't know. Um, this is the tube that's being used as a mixer tube. 6.3. Yeah, we'll get to plug it in now. And let's double check everything else. Um, 4, 10, L, 5, 2, 7, 6, 3, 5, 2, 7, 6, 3, 4,100, 4,100, okay, oh, 33, C, 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 D. Now this guy should test around 900, better than 900, better than 960, 960, so, so, you know, there's a thousand right there. There we go. She's a winner. That's the only test. Now there's three of these tubes. So let's just keep things rolling here. I'm going to pull out, I'm going to try to pull out um, tube number two. Just one second. I'm absolutely sure I'm getting the right tube. Tube number two. This will be uh, one of the IF amplifiers. Is it a 6BA? So it's got writing on it. Look at that. What's all that? Guarantee. It's a place where you can write something. Silver tone. 6B6. What's that actually say? I can't say I've ever seen a contractual statement put on a, on a tube before. So let's just see what it says. Guarantee. We guarantee this tube to give 
perfect satisfaction for one year. Simpson Sears Limited. Simpson Sears was a huge retailer here in Canada and in the States. I think here in the States it might be called Simpsons or something like that. Bought your tube at Simpson Sears. Wow. Okay, let's put them in. I've never seen a statement like that written right on the tube. I gotta get me more of those Simpson Sears tubes. Of course, they won't live up to their guarantee anymore. Well, the one year's gone by, hasn't it? We need a slight, slightly up on pin one. Doesn't seem to mean anything. Pin one. Pin one. Oh. I don't have my tube book here. Ah, I won't worry about it. Okay. I'm not worrying about tube one. Tiny little leak. We're gonna hit the button here. Nine six again, thousand, thousand up around a thousand around here. Right over. Very good. Now one more. This will be the uh, oh wait a minute, I think I just pulled the wrong tube. Let me be sure what I'm doing here. V three, that's right, I did pull the wrong one. V three. Six BA six. There we go. No big promises on this one. It just says Westinghouse on it. I think probably of all the things being manufactured in large numbers back in say the fifties, vacuum tubes were probably one of the most precision manufactured items coming out. This was sort of a, an example of a limit of technology to some degree. You know what? I did up the uh, line adjust when I had that rectifier in there. I've got to turn it back down. So that, that precision is going to matter. Did you this, did not? Did not? No, nope, nothing showing up. Nothing on pin one this time. Okay. Well, it's only supposed to get up, you know, a thousand, throw it away. And it's at 1500. So all these tubes are testing good. Now, I think that's it for the BA6s. So I'll pull this guy out. This would be tube number five. And what is it? It's made in Japan. It says Marconi on it. 6C4 oscillator tube. Okay, I'm going to get my uh, uh, tester set up here for it. Okay, I think I know why there's two plate tests here. The 6C4. The plate is hooked up to both pin 5 and pin 1. So all this tester is doing is it's making sure both terminals are connected to the, uh, to the single plate. So it's only one plate. My, my head was coming apart there for a minute. Now did I double check all of this? Two, I probably did 20H. Do it again. 3076P. 3076P. 5100. 5100. 44. F. We're good to go. 1430. So this should be, well, that's 1500 in the middle. 1430. Well above. The sockets get worn out on tube testers eh, from all the uh, tube testing. Now we have two more tubes left to do. One is a W45 times 2. Don't know what that means. 6SC7. Okay, I'm going to get that uh, set up. Okay. 6SC7. This is the uh, combination BFO oscillator tube and audio preamp. Two tubes in one. No shorts. 
So we're looking in this case for 880. So should be up, up past my finger, hopefully. Um, six, let's see. Seven. Yeah. Eight, eight, yeah up there. Here we go. Okay, well, it's well above 880. Now we test the other half of the two. B1, G. So now the other half of the two. jumping around there. Okay, so that's usually the tester. You can see the pointer is kind of wiggling up, stable now. So there we're getting, you know, 1100 on a tube which should be rejected at 880. And the tube's job is oscillator and audio amplifier. So if it's weak on the audio amplifier, you just turn up the volume a bit more. Weak on the oscillator, uh, the well would have to be really weak, I think. I don't think this is weak enough to be any. It's not that weak. Okay, what are we down to? We're down to the very last tube. This is kind of an, a, a different looking tube from others. I don't know if any other tube looks like this. A little short guy. This is a 6H6. This is the dual, dual diode. Two, two diodes in here. Okay, well, I'm going to set up for it. Okay, got that tube in there. Now, the owner has told me that he tested all these tubes himself with his own tube tester, uh, not a dynamic tube tester like this one, a simpler one. And this is the only tube he thought was suspicious. So I'm interested to see how this one comes out. This again is it two tubes in one, two identical tubes in one. 6H6. Okay, we're all set here. In this case, we're flipping the diode rectifier switch. This is a diode, so it should come up above this where it says diode's okay. So it should come up above my finger there on this switch. There we are. And we test the other half. K1, K1. Test again. Well, it tests fine. I don't think there's any concern here. So that's a, a little bit disappointing. I was kind of hoping this one would be weak. And then that would explain a lot about the performance of the radio. The lack of performance. But not the case. So we're going to operate the radio again to confirm its its uh, weakness or its strength. And I'm going to make sure, I'm going to stop for a minute, I'm going to make sure the antenna's switched on and everything here. Okay, we're ready to go. Starting with the uh, the dim bolts in the circuit there. All is fine. In the meantime, have a look at this fuse. Okay, the meantime was, wasn't, wasn't mean enough. Look at this fuse here. This is the only fuse I've ever seen that has a fuse link that looks exactly like the fuse symbol you see on schematics. <laughs> uh, that's a big honking fuse too. Look at the thing. Five amp, it's a five amp. I think this goes into like a million dollar stereo. I think this is the kind of fuse a stereo, you know, the crazy stereo guy would like. Okay, radio. How are you doing now? Loads of volume. We're on the broadcast band. I imagine that's 640 there. Let's try a different antenna arrangement. Yeah. 
I'm going to close this. I'm going to use my antenna like it's a, a wire antenna. What happens if we do this now? That hurts it. <laughs> okay, we'll leave that unhooked. Not sure that really made any difference. Shouldn't be a station there. We'll be talking sports. Yes, they're talking about sports. So this is 590. Should be here. That's not bad. 640. 680. It's right there. So this is a good example of a now a better radio can separate out the noise you're hearing from the signal you're hearing. The two of them are not on top of each other, they're side by side. And this this radio unfortunately is getting it all in there. Probably looks a little more like that. Whereas a much better radio could do that, and all you're going to hear is that. Or, maybe if I align this carefully enough, it'll be a little better. Maybe. How about 840? 860? It's odd to me that when this radio first got on my bench and I tested it, I was able to pick up the uh, French station here, which is a good test for a bit of a weak signal reception. It won't get it anymore now that I've fixed up the radio. Hmm. Okay, uh, what would be next now is alignment. Um, that's all that's... Oh, no, there's one more thing I should do before alignment, and that's uh, there's a voltage check... Uh, there's voltage check information. Uh, okay, let me stop and get ready for something. We're going to do some voltage checks here. Okay, just like everybody, I'm having a ton of trouble with my printer printing a document I need. But in the meantime, this has been on for like half an hour, so let's do a heat run test. I've got my thermal viewer here. Just a little hard to get on camera, but let's see what we can do with it. So, what we can see here. And we see something very hot up here. That's these two tubes up here. If I put my hand in front, they should disappear. Yeah, see? My cold hand. So those two tubes are much hotter than the other tubes. This one's this one's a little that's a light bulb. I'm trying to figure out what, what this is right here. I think it's just the light bulb. Transformer doesn't show up. It depends on the temperature settings on this, what turns red and what doesn't turn red. I have it set fairly high right now. So when we look at the rest of the tubes on here. See this one? See my finger go in front of it? It's a little warmer than the rest. So BA6, BA6, BA6. You can definitely see the difference though between the signal tubes, which aren't running all that hot, and these guys, who ended up burning my little finger here. Look at the white spot on it. <laughs> now, what's going on underneath the radio? So we need to flip the radio over in order to find that out. I'm going to do it transformer side down for stability reasons. There we go. For a moment, I saw I thought I saw a wisp of smoke. <laughs> no, I don't think so. So, nothing's glowing red offhand. Let's see what we get here. So, what's going to happen now is the tube sockets are going to show up on here. But I think what I'm really seeing right now are these two resistors right here. Now their temperature is. 70 degrees. That's the hottest temperature on the screen here. 70 degrees. Yeah, 
so you know that's that's not too hot I don't think that's 70 degrees 68 69 so what's happening is the viewer will tell you the temperature of the hottest pixel on the screen and it just reports it as a number down here the hottest and the coldest so I'm reading the hottest number. I'm not reading this big number. I'm reading a little red number here. 70. Looking for things that come up in red. Nothing. Another thing we should look for are things that are hot that shouldn't be hot, but that, that's a little hard to... There's, there's resistors all through here. There's nothing much happening up in this part of the radio, though. That's the signal portion, so you, you kind of doubt there'd be something with heat in it. Now. So there's a large wattage resistor here and a large one here. They're both showing up uh, green on my screen. You, you can't really see it in the camera, I'm afraid. It's, I just can't make this work that well. Bottom line is nothing is overheating. These guys are a little hot. Maybe I'll move that capacitor away from it there a little bit. Just to... Uh, you put two hot resistors close together, that's not so wise either. Let me just make sure I'm not going to get a shock here. So I'm just moving this away. And these should be separated from each other more. Shouldn't do this with the radio operating, of course no big deal at all nothing is going wrong here heat wise I'm gonna leave it up because we're going to do, be doing alignment and that might be worthwhile looking underneath here a little bit for now I'm going to go see if my printer finally printed something well it's taken me a torturous hour to print this out holy smokes I just go through you know the same stuff I'm sure you go through in your house once in a while try to get your computers to do what you want them to do. Holy smokes. I printed this to save me five minutes and it's taken me like an hour to get this printed. Uh, okay, but now I have it. And So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do the voltage tests in here according to this chart. And when I'm all done, we will review it and see if it says, see if it points, see if it highlights anything. Well, I haven't gotten anywhere here because the first test is way off already and I don't understand how that can be. So, starting with the rectifier tube. Shows the two plates, plate and plate. Is the voltage, 240 volts AC. 240 volts AC. That's coming straight from the transformer. The actual reading I get though is 100 volts. Uh, all voltages are measured between tube socket terminals and chassis. That's what I'm doing. Let's try this again. So I've got my meter over here on AC. I'm on the 150 volt scale. We're supposed to test I didn't put the pin numbers here, but this is a bottom view. So we count this way. One, two, three, four, and six. Four and six are the plates. It should have 240 volts on them. Plate. So we're counting from the one, two, three. This is pin four. 150 volt scale. We get 100 volts. 5, 6, you can actually see the wire coming right out of the transformer here. What's going on? 100 volts. Well, let's see what's coming out as B plus then. Uh, B plus we would find it's supposed to be 245 volts. Ooh, I only measured it a little over 100 in the radio. Uh, Hmm. 
Am I reading this right? Heater, heater, 245? Not connected. 215? What's going on here? Plate and plate. Where's the cathode? There's no cathode, it's the heater. That's it. Yeah, yeah, that's what's going on, Jim. There's no cathode. So the heater carries the positive voltage. So we'll get on the heater. It's pin number 8. Should give us 245 volts DC. I think I got it. I think I know what I'm doing. I think I know what I'm doing. So that would be this guy right here. Next to nothing. What's going? Okay, something's going wrong here. Something's going wrong. Is my ground wire broken finally? Is that what's happened? Wouldn't get any readings. So if I take a reading on the filter capacitor here, just to take a look. 150 volt scale. There's nothing there. What's happened? Something is... Something is not right. You know, I think this has broken. <laughs> I think I finally broke my ground wire here. No, there's metal in there. Oh boy, this has not been a good day for me at all. There's no doubt it's making contact. Got this on AC. Da, 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 da. That's a problem. Okay, back to trying to read 245 volts on the heater. Right here. 500 volt scale. 245. Halfway up. Okay, so it's almost halfway up. 200 volts. I don't know what's going on with those AC readings. I'm going to pretend I didn't, I didn't take them. So we should find 245 on pins 8 and 2. Pin 8, yeah, so we just did that. Pin 8, there it is, 200. And then pin 2 is kind of hidden back here. Exactly the same. 200. Not 245. And I, I got this up to correct voltage so right now 116 volts on the radio it's low 200 okay so nothing unusual going on here just not quite not quite the high voltage is what we might expect okay I'm gonna carry on and do the rest that was all kind of a pile of nonsense wasn't it okay so the result of that is and just to be really clear what I'm doing anyway. I'm not checking all these voltages. I'm checking the plate voltage and the screen voltage where it, where it exists to make sure those high voltages are there. And what I found is everywhere it is low except two measurements. <laughs> so for instance you're supposed to find 230 volts here I'm finding 180. 50 volts off. Yeah, you're supposed to find 180 here I'm finding 130. You're supposed to find 130 here I'm finding 100. Yeah. Supposed to find 215 here, I'm finding 150. Supposed to find 80 there, I'm finding 80. How does that happen? Same thing over here. It's supposed to be 230, I get 50. It's supposed to be 90, I get 80. Uh, you'd think they'd all be depressed. Now I did an initial test, which amounted to the output of the uh, power supply transformer, which gave me a funny number. That funny number can explain this whole thing. So I am going to get my ungrounded meter here, provided I can find it. I cannot find it. Okay, so I've, 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 I must have run through the house with my meter. Okay, I gotta go find it. Okay, so I'm gonna read the output of the power supply transformer. Got this on 750 volts AC. See a red wire there, see a red wire here. I 
I should probably really look at the uh, pin out to get this right rather than relying on colors. So it would be the rectifier tube I would want to check. 5Y3. Y3? I don't know. 5Y3. So the plates at 6 and 4. 6 and 4. 6 and 4. So between 6 and 4, we should find the total output of this transformer. 6 and 4. So that's 7. 6 and 4 is 1, 2, 3, 4. And 6. 330. Three volts. Let's check each side. Hmm. It's all here. Two twenty nine. One oh five. Uh, I think we got a power. I think we got a power transformer problem here. 228 is probably correct. Huh. Well, I've only encountered bad um, bad power transformers a couple of times and I'll, never in a radio like, like this. Um, so it's feeding, the output of the transformer is feeding to the two plates. We should see 240 volts AC. I'm seeing 240 on one and one something on the other. I mean, what else can we conclude from that? Uh, I should pull the rectifier tube out and make another measurement. So with the rectifier tube in, right across the output, it was 333, wasn't it? Let's just repeat this. 333. Okay, set off. Now, hey, remember that burn? I'm not going to get another one. Where's my burn protection here? This this has a rating of about eight seconds. I got to get the tube out and out of my hand in eight seconds. If I wait one minute for the tube to cool down, then I've got 14 seconds. Okay, rectifier tube is out. Power up the set, nothing much is going to happen now, but the total unloaded output of this transformer would be sitting on those two terminals. Power on, but I'm going to do it through the dim bulb. Check the power at the radio. It's going to be doing the heater thing still. It's going to be 117. Close enough. Should be getting a realistic measurement the unloaded output voltage of this transformer. Seven hundred and fifty volt scale still wearing my glove. Why not? Here. Don't move the terminal. And here. Same thing. To ground. Two thirty on one side, one hundred on the other. How does that happen? So if you have uh, so many windings in the primary and a few of them short, you end up with less windings in the primary. You get more voltage out of the secondaries. If you short in the secondaries, uh, assuming that there's basically uh, one winding center tapped, or you can think of it as two windings, one of them has shorts in it, so a good deal of the turns have disappeared, you get low output. Shorted turns on one half of this transformer, so resulting in low output. What can we do about that? Pray it doesn't get worse. That's about it, I think. 
I don't think there's much that can be done to, uh, you know, other than jacking up the supply right from here. Of course, you can't do that practically. So the radio is what it is. Uh, wait a minute now, there's a bunch of resistors in the power supply. So one of them knocking the voltage way down and we could, we could undo that. I don't think I don't I don't think there's anything we can do here to fix this problem. I think we got to live with it. Radio's still working. At B plus a little low. Let's look at the schematic. Maybe maybe there is something in there. Let's just take a look here. Okay, so uh, this is all kind of new to me. I've never really thought about how to. I've, I've never had to even think about compensating for something in here. So what I think has happened is some of the windings in one side here have shorted. So there's fewer windings. So one side's low. You know, ultimately, all it does in, in it is result in a lower B plus. Even though one side's weak here, it doesn't really do anything. It just kind of averages out here. These resistors are intended to uh, assist with the filtering of the DC. So you know, I could reduce these. That would increase the output voltage. Uh, but the limit, the limit, the limit is what's coming out of here. Six and two. Did, didn't I read those? Didn't I read those? Let me check. On those pins, in terms of DC volts, um, 200. So the most we could get through this radio is 200. And we're getting 180 where we should be getting 240. Oh, I could maybe make the 180, 190. Ah, it's not going to get me anywhere. There, there's no, there's no particular solution here. I don't think. I don't think I want to fool around with these. So, what's the consequences of low B plus? Um, if it's not really low, then all it does is just quiet everything down. Everything is less. Lots of volume coming out of the radio, so why worry about it? That's the bottom line, I think. Why worry about it? We know we know what's going on, and then just carry on with the radio. And carrying on with the radio means means going through these alignment steps. Okay, well, I think I'm ready for alignment, but uh, maybe we've gone too long already today, so I gotta stop and check all that. Maybe this is if this is the end of the video. Hey, thanks a lot for watching.